Welcome to the Indian Ocean World Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Indian Ocean World Podcast. Thank you for downloading. My name is Philip Gooding, a postdoctoral fellow at the Indian Ocean World Center or IWC at McGill University. I am joined by Dr. Artisman Chowdhury, another postdoctoral fellow at the IWC. Hello, Philip. Thank you for having me here. Uh, you will hear more from Artisman later. Uh, we have two guests for you today. Firstly, we are joined by Professor Margaret Kalisker, an, o an Associate Professor of Geography at McGill University. Professor Kalisker has a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on the application of remote sensing, that is satellite, airborne and drone imagery, to environmental questions. She is involved with several interdisciplinary projects, including the IAWC's partnership project, Appraising Risk Past and Present, on whose website you will find this podcast posted, in which she uses Bayesian networks analysis of historical data. Professor Kalisker, thank you for joining us. Hi, Philip. Hi, Archisman. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, our second guest is Mr. Oliver Lucanus, also of McGill University. Mr. Lucanus is a nature photographer, videographer, and experienced conservation researcher. Through over 60 expeditions to 25 countries, he has discovered several new species of fish and documented many species in their natural habitat for the first time. His most recent book is The Amazon Below Water, which is a collection spanning 18 years of expeditions in South America, illustrating more than 170 species of fish, frogs, mammals, and birds in their natural habitats. Mr. Lucanus, thank you for joining us today as well. Hi, Philip. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you again. Uh, Professor Kaliska and Mr. Lucanus have joined us today to discuss aspects of their joint project, the Fish and Forest Project, which, is, which assesses the impacts of land cover and forest loss on endemic fishes. In short, this project seeks to explain the link between the disappearance of highly endemic and specialized fishes and changes in their environment. The project uses data from historical aerial photography, satellite imagery, and new information captured by UAV and in-situ observations to investigate and document the historical changes in the habitat of threatened aquatic species. This project investigates regions as diverse as Brazil, Tanzania, and Canada. But today, Professor Kaliska and Ms. Lucanus are going to discuss their work in Madagascar, situating their discussion in the southwestern Indian Ocean world. Listeners may also be keen to know that they've put together a slideshow of their work. And so this podcast is also being recorded in video format, which you can see on the Appraising Risk website. So to kick this discussion off, perhaps Mr. Lucanus, you can tell us more about the relationship between forest and endemic freshwater fish. Why is forest important to freshwater fish? So we obviously understand why forest is important for, for birds and for mammals and even for amphibians. But fish are usually the first animals that are actually affected when there's a change in land cover. So the forest provides, of course, filtration for the water going into the streams, but it's essential for keeping the temperature. And we don't think of uh, tropical regions to be so temperature sensitive, but uh, most freshwater fish that are highly endemic that occur in these small streams and in smaller rivers need, absolutely need the forest cover because if the temperature rises, uh, it will give way to other species uh, to come in or for, other, for some of the endemic species that are real forest species to even die because of the change in temperature or because of the change in turbidity when the topsoil is washed into their habitat. Thank you. So now turning more specifically to Madagascar, what are the main factors driving extinction of freshwater fish in Madagascar? And also, how do we know about this? I, how recent is our knowledge of biodiversity there? So, of course, Madagascar is famous because it has so many endemic species uh, of the, the lemurs, the frogs, the chameleons, all, all of these sort of iconic species that are conservation stories uh, are, are well known from Madagascar and are well studied for, for centuries. Uh, the freshwater fish of Madagascar have that same level of endemism where almost 50% of them are, are fish that only occur in Madagascar and nowhere else on earth. And 
most of their uh, most of this diversity has been discovered only very recently. So uh, more than 50% of the species that we currently know have been described after 1990. So the forest loss in Madagascar is is also very recent. Uh, it actually slowed uh, well. It slowed down in the 1990s because most of it had been cut. So we don't even know how many species of freshwater fish in Madagascar have been lost. So of course the lemurs are well studied, but also uh, protected to somewhat. Especially the iconic species of lemurs have uh, reserves and national parks that are well funded. The same thing goes for some of the reptile species, of course, chameleons, and uh, there are some tortoises that are endemic to Madagascar. But the fish have virtually no protection. So there are now 72 described endemic freshwater fish in Madagascar. This is Lamena or Paretropolis nurisati, which literally means the red one. Uh, it's been described in 1998. It is uh, uh, endangered or perhaps critically endangered at this point. Uh, we have been to this location uh, in, in the 2000s, and when you refer to La Mena, which people think it's a goldfish because it's the same color. Uh, so most of these fish, because they are described so recently, uh, are only known from very, very small ranges, and we don't know what their historical ranges were at this point. Uh, this is Paretropolis maculatus. This one has been around a little bit longer. This is also critically endangered. And a lot of this diversity is in the East Coast rainforest because the last remaining bits of forest in Madagascar are mostly along the East Coast. Here there is a little bit less population and the rivers are very short and come off the, the plateau into, and go in westward. Uh, flow eastwards into the Indian Ocean. So this is the distribution of endemic fish as we know it today. Uh, you can see that the diversity is pretty much centered on that east coast. On the right, you can see how little protected areas there are. Uh, the endemic fish range uh, compared to the, to the actual amount of protected area is truly minute and none of the freshwater places in Madagascar are actually protected. Most protected areas in Madagascar end at the lakefront or riverfront of the region. This is the deforestation in Madagascar um, beginning in 2000. Uh, the historical picture on the left, uh, this is 1953, and you can now, as I cycle through the years, see how the forest cover on the east coast and overall is disappearing. Since we know fish in Madagascar need the forest, every time one of these streams has the forests around it cut, it's leading to a direct extinction event for that species. Now, the population has grown. Uh, we had 11.6 million people in 1990, 24 million people in 2015, and uh, the projection for 2050 is an estimate of 54 million people. Uh, that is a lot of resources and that is a lot of forest that is going to be lost. The traditional Malagasy uh, agricultural practice is called Tavi. It is slash and burn agriculture. So uh, people will set fire to the forest at the bottom of the hill and it will burn up the hill. They will plant uh, cassava or bananas or a crop for one season and then with the rainy season most of that topsoil is carried down into the stream and they need to burn another area to continue the agriculture. Um, this kind of practice is of course devastating to all animals living in the forest but also to the fish. The landscape is changing in Madagascar not just because of people but because of global warming as well. Uh, Margaret will later show us how uh, the, the surface water in Madagascar is reducing more and more. So these pictures are uh, 13 years apart and taken in the same place at the same time. 
Uh, this is in Nosy Bay, one of the uh, large islands in front of the northwestern coast of Madagascar. There are crater lakes that are up on top of the mountains. Uh, these also have endemic fish in them. Uh, the reason I wanted to point this out is that the biggest uh, reason for the extinction of Malagasy fish, aside from the changes in land cover and the, the global warming, is the fact that people have introduced foreign species all over the island. That includes in the national parks and that includes uh, a crater like, like a lake like this on top of Nosy Bay that has no people living around it. So there's really no reason to introduce a foreign species here. The central highlands where most of the population is uh, have of course been com almost completely deforested. So uh, this uh, project I photographed here is actually a, uh, a church-based NGO that had planted thousands of trees on these hills to reforest them. But you can see that this area has been burned just the same. The central highlands, you can, you can drive uh, throughout Madagascar and see almost no, no trees left remaining. Uh, we can see here how the erosion will then carry the topsoil uh, away from, uh, from the central highlands. If you look at the larger rivers in Madagascar, even from satellite photographs, you can see this red earth washing into the Indian Ocean. Uh, one of the, the sort of most famous reptile species uh, that is near extinction is the Malagasy plowshare tortoise that is found in the south of Madagascar. Uh, this is an animal that is both being poached by the ornamental trade, uh, as well as uh, eaten by locals, uh, as well as being uh, critically endangered due to the fact that its, uh, its habitat, the spiny forest in southern Madagascar, is uh, disappearing at the equally rapid rate. Uh, where you do get these pockets of, of forest in the bottom of the hill is where some species survive. Uh, Montella Kowani would be one that comes to mind. I don't have a photograph of it. Uh, even though I've been to Madagascar seven times, I've never seen this frog. Uh, it is uh, related to Montella madagascariensis. Uh, one of many very small colorful frogs are endemic to Madagascar. And these animals are also dependent on the forest. So what is the biggest problem with these invasive species? Uh, if I use an example for like Australia, then the snakehead fish is the cat. Uh, it's a predator, it gets very large, it's introduced from Asia, and uh, these guys are eating their way through the native Malagasy species. Uh, it's a fish that's incredibly adaptable, that's why it's also a problem in, uh, in British Columbia and Canada. It is a problem on the east coast of the United States and pretty much everywhere that it has been introduced. The equivalent, if that is the cat, then this is the rabbit. So Coptodon rendali, or the red tilapia, is one of several tilapia species that was initially introduced to provide a, a, an additional uh, food source to the population. The problem with this cichlid, uh, unlike the Malagasy cichlids, is that it's incredibly prolific. It will outbreed the native species with ease because it is breeding all year round, uh, producing uh, several hundred young even in a habitat that has been uh, uh, heavily affected by the land cover change. It doesn't matter if there's a high oxygen level or what the temperature is. So uh, Coptodon are the rabbits. Uh, Coptodon and Oreochromis are simply outbreeding the native species and taking over their habitat. And the third is the mosquito fish. Uh, both the guppy and the gambusia uh, were introduced for controlling malaria in Madagascar. The problem is that not only have they brought some disease that are affecting native species, these fish in, in their native range are very effective egg and fry predators. So they are, the males are only two, three centimeters long, but they have simply understood to go into the nests of the larger cichlids and eat their eggs or eat their babies. Now in Central America and the Caribbean where these fish come from originally, the native fish know that this is a fry predator and will actively defend their nest against them. The Malagasy fish don't. 
So this is a Paretroplus menarambo. You can see the Malagasy cichlids are quite primitive. They will just lay their eggs out uh, in the open on a flat surface. Uh, in Madagascar, they don't really have anything that will go in there and eat the eggs. But the Gambusia that are now everywhere in Madagascar will simply go in and pick away at the eggs and the parents pretty much do not defend the nest against these egg and fry predators. So in addition to being eaten by the snakehead and being outbred by the tilapia, uh, they also have to deal with these tiny mosquito fish that are actually affecting their, their populations. Uh, cichlids in Madagascar are weird for another reason, because cichlid fish are distributed in South and Central America as well as Africa, and there are three species in India. Uh, the cichlids of Madagascar are not related to the African species at all. They are only uh, close relatives are the three Indian species of cichlids. The problem in Madagascar is not just where there are people. It is extended to all the national parks. So this is a Marodich National Park in northern Madagascar. And it is uh, very difficult uh, to access. Uh, we had for our expedition, this is a, a barely a truck from the United Nations that uh, is part of a, was part of a donation. So this still had the stickers. It saw action in the, in the Serbian, Serbian and Croatian war theater for the UN. And uh, this is the only way to get around. A, a normal vehicle wouldn't be able to do the roads. And uh, this national park has one of many Bedotia species. So Bedotia marodij, described only in the year 2000 and found uh, just a couple of years before that, is essentially extinct since 2015. So even though it is occurring only in a national park, was only found recently, it is already gone. Uh, at least the two expeditions that have tried to confirm whether the species still exists have, have been unable to find it. Um, Bedotia uh, are rainbow fish. So rainbow fish uh, don't occur in India and don't occur in Africa, but their relatives are in Papua New Guinea and Australia. So this continues the, the weirdness of, of Malagasy uh, fauna and flora that we see in, in the mammals and we see in the reptiles. So, you know, the, the cichlid fish come from India, the rainbow fish come from Australia. So there, there is not much consistency in Madagascar. And these fish are essentially like our minnows. So they occur in short rivers that uh, go directly from a mountain to the ocean. Uh, their, their biggest diversity is in the bird's head, the Fogokop Peninsula of, of Papua New Guinea. And they uh, don't travel well, so they cannot exit their river and go into the ocean and enter the next river. Because of that, they have huge diversity. Uh, we have about 20 species described in Madagascar, but there are 20 to 25 new species that are awaiting description. So it is uh, probably safe to say that every uh, river basin from Madagascar's east coast that is draining towards the Indian Ocean has its own species of Bedotia or had its own species of Bedotia because we are losing these fish as we speak every year. Uh, another fish uh, is uh, Bedotia sakarami. Uh, this is also found in a national park. It was considered extinct. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Ozell and I re uh, rediscovered this fish in 1993 in a plantation in northern Madagascar. And it's one of the species that uh, the American Zoological Association and others have uh, managed to breed in large numbers and have reintroduced in its native range. So it, it's a little bit of a success story. Uh, to reintroduce species when they are small like this and easy to reproduce is perhaps possible if, it's, uh, if you can manage to protect their native range. And uh, the last one I want to show today is this ugly thing. It's Pitaikochromus insolitus. It was described in 2006, so it's uh, a relatively new fish also. Uh, it's from northwestern Madagascar. And what's so special about it is that it's actually made the mainstream news. So it is the only freshwater fish uh, that has made uh, the newspapers in, in recent years 
um, because the London Zoo was down to having just one specimen of this fish um, and an expedition was mounted to find this fish a mate and to find the species again. Uh, it was found again and uh, it was a good enough story from, you know, I have here from the Star, from the Atlantic, from Scientific American. It was a big enough story for a gray freshwater fish from Madagascar to actually be interesting enough for mainstream news to pick, pick this up. Uh, I checked today. Uh, as of uh, today, the uh, Malagasy Fish Working Group that is working throughout zoos and public aquariums in, uh, across the world has 1,406 specimens of this fish. Uh, we don't know if it still exists in its native range. There is also a breeding project for it in Madagascar that has several thousand specimens. So this is uh, one of the few success stories uh, that we can talk about when it comes to endemic fish of Madagascar. Um, I will uh, let Margaret uh, take over from here and tell you a little bit more about how we can measure what is happening in the country. Uh, thanks, Oliver. Uh, so here in these two maps, uh, what we'd really like to, to get across is just the really limited amount of formal protection that aquatic species have in Madagascar. So if we think about the IUCN categories of endangered or critically endangered, uh, you can see there uh, in the different polygons with the endangered on the left and the critically endangered on the right, how many species there are uh, found within those areas and those polygons represent protected areas. Now, of course, those areas are predominantly terrestrial. So if we look at how much water is actually in those polygons, you see that there's just over around two and a half square kilometers that is actually protected for endangered species and less than half a square kilometer for the critically endangered. So even though um, Madagascar does have these initiatives to create protected areas, they are really not focused on the aquatic uh, organisms at all. And then if we look at on the next slide, um, the overall amount of surface water, um, one of the main challenges besides the lack of protection is you see that the amount of actual water is decreasing over time. So we have the different freshwater ecoregions there on the map on the left. And if we look at all of the surface water that we extract from satellite imagery, we can see for the mid 80s to mid 90s, we had just under so 5,000 square kilometers, and that has steadily decreased um, to 2013, 2016, to just over 4,200. And this trend continues. So not only are they in areas that are not protected, but also their actual habitat, keeping in mind that they need to be in the aquatic environment, is also shrinking as, as time goes on. And so we'd like to show you a, a quick case study here about uh, Reliquis Pellegrini. And this is actually a, a really interesting um, situation because this genus here, um, it has around seven described species and one new one um, that Oliver had found um, on their last trip to Madagascar, but um, they weren't able to bring any specimens out. Uh, it's one of the genuses that is really sensitive to temperature change. So as you heard before, as you cut the, um, the riparian forest around the water bodies, there's going to be an increase in the temperature of the water. And so along there, the river that crosses your screen from left to right, the Manandriana River, that is where Reocles Pellegrini is from. So this first image here is from 2010. And you see already there is some forest around there, but there's also some clearing that is happening. And so now if we look at um, 2019, and these are both images taken in October, so they're pretty consistent in terms of the, the time of year, um, you can actually see that there is encroachment, especially from the east there, as um, settlements are growing larger and there is going to be uh, more and more deforestation around its habitat. So we looked at this as a case study to see what is going to happen to its range and its habitat suitability into the future. So looking at changes in temperature, uh, projected changes in temperature, projected changes in precipitation, um, projected changes in human population, 
and also the characteristics of, the, of its environment, such as the elevation where it is found and the amount of forest cover and the actual integrity of the forest cover itself. So it's not just there's a small patch, but that there's actually a coherent forest around where it's found. So on the left, where you have 1990, and within that blue polygon, that is where, um, if we look at the IUCN list, that's the polygon where this species is found. However, its range is much smaller than that. It's actually within that yellow circle. So just that's where the, the river that you saw previously in the satellite images were. And if we look at all of these factors together, we can see that it has a very small region there where it's actually suitable. So what are the areas that actually match where that fish was actually found in 1990 that we know it was actually present? Now we can take those characteristics of suitability and see, well, what happened in 2017? So you can see within the yellow circle, the areas that are highly suitable that the, the fish can do well in have decreased. Now there's other areas to the south that perhaps look like it's an improvement, but we know that the fish is actually not found there. So its overall area is already limited in 2017 as it was in comparison to 1990. Now we can take this a step further and say, well, with these projections into the future, what is going to happen in 2050? And so on our next slide, what we have is our projection of what is going to be the deforestation. Um, between 2017 and 2050. So all of those red pixels are the ones that our model is um, predicting are going to be cut by 2050. And this really depends on the road network, the proximity to previous deforestation, the proximity to settlements, and what is the projection for growth in human population. And so you see we are losing a considerable amount of forest there from the south, but it's also sort of eating away at the edges of that intact forest throughout that area that um, this particular species can be found in. And what's really unfortunate is that when you look at the map on the right, and the black dots are actually um, locations where the species was found in 1990, and you see that that's no longer suitable. So its entire habitat is projected to be gone. And this, when we look at what are the factors, um, of course, deforestation is one of the main ones, but also the fact that for this part of Madagascar, it's going to be projected that the temperatures are going to increase. So we've lost the forest cover, we're heating the water, and we also have warmer temperatures, but we're also losing the seasonality and the precipitation. And those two factors combined uh, really make it that the area where it was found in 1990 is no longer an area that is really suitable for that particular species. So there's a good chance that by 2050, it'll be very difficult to find specimens in the wild. Uh, thank you to both of you for that. Um, I am now gonna turn to Asman, who I believe has questions for both of you. Um, thank you, Philip. And thank you, Professor Kalaska and Mr. Lokanas for discussing your research with us. I have a number of questions for Professor Kalaska and they pertain to the methodology of her work. Given the dire circumstances on the extensive land cover change, what is the purpose of mapping and forecasting their habitat extents? Essentially, uh, how does digital mapping facilitate this project? So as we can see that the outlook doesn't look very promising. However, uh, we do believe it's important to document what is the actual um, current circumstances that these species find themselves in. And also what is the historical trend and what is the spatial pattern in terms of how the landscape has changed. So if we actually have this uh, clear view of what are the different factors in the landscape, how have they changed, we can make more um, more pot potentially more accurate models in the future to see how is the actual area going to change for these species. So we, even though the outcome might not change, we can at least understand what are the main factors that are going to be influencing the species. And then perhaps there could be certain intervention measures for a few species as, as the ones that you mentioned, the smaller ones that were success stories that, that Oliver showed. Um, but for many of them, unfortunately, intervention is, 
unlikely going to happen, but at least we can document uh, what is actually happening. Um, thank you, Professor Kalaska. I now have two questions for Mr. Lukanus, but they're interlinked, so I will ask them together. Firstly, why are conservation efforts so difficult for these species in Madagascar? And secondly, given the situation, what is the outlook for these species? Um, I think that uh, conservation is very much centered around a high profile species. So uh, finding funds and finding money for uh, freshwater fish conservation is, is, is a struggle and that's not just in Madagascar. Uh, I think that the, the big picture here is also what is happening here with these highly endemic fish in Madagascar is also happening elsewhere, uh, including in North America. So North American darter species that occur in Tennessee uh, and, and, uh, and Arkansas and this region are very, very similar as in their needs for having uh, forest cover and these clear, fast flowing streams. So uh, maybe the biggest challenge is that the fish are just not high profile enough for NGOs and funding agencies to, to, to get into doing that. And the other thing is that freshwater is such a vital resource um, that it's maybe in a, in a developing country, maybe much more difficult to, to uh, prevent freshwater from being used for fish farming or agriculture or whatever other source, or for that matter, to produce electricity because dams are uh, a, a very bad factor when it comes to freshwater fish converse, conservation that we haven't discussed. So I, I think that the, you know, both what we think should be funded and what human needs are stand a little bit in the way of, uh, of the freshwater fish. Uh, what can be done is, uh, is a, different, uh, a different question in the sense that uh, it, it depends what, what we uh, want to happen to the biodiversity on our planet. So if, if we can agree that uh, biodiversity, no matter of what type matters, and that the, the fate of the fish is essentially directly linked to the fate of the lemurs and of the, the people themselves that uh, make uh, an area livable for humans, then uh, perhaps people should pay greater attention to what is happening to freshwater fish. Thank you, Mr. Lukanus. I will now pass the baton back to Philip. Do you have a question to wrap up things? Uh, yes, thank you, Artisman. Uh, and thank you again to um, both of you for agreeing to talk to us again. Um, I have one final question, which I think either of you could answer. It ties more broadly with our interest at the IWC, and that is, of course, the interdisciplinary nature of your research, which I think is something we're all engaged in. Thus, I just want to ask you a broader methodological question. Um, what does your collaboration say about the methodological opportunities and constraints of interdisciplinary research when it comes to mapping, and the natural sciences? Uh, maybe this is a very big question, but if maybe one, one or both of you could sum up in a few simple or bullet points, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Maybe um, Oliver could start and then I'll, I'll wrap up with some final, final thoughts. Yeah, I think we, we've kind of noticed that uh, the, the, the big picture that remote sensing affords people to, to look at an entire habitat and to also go back in time is maybe something that is uh, getting ignored a little bit by, by taxonomists and by biologists. Uh, so I think that uh, the remote sensing can bring a, a big picture to, to, to these other sciences that uh, over long term could affect policy or over long term at least could affect how we understand that extinction is happening, uh, not just in Madagascar, but also elsewhere. Uh, Margaret? And also, if we think about sort of what remote sensing is, many people are familiar with Google Earth or they look at maps on their phones and um, we have to realize that there is a whole other sort of wealth of information that comes from sort of hundreds of satellites in orbit that are constantly observing our planet. And we can use these resources that are getting more um, accurate, they're getting better detail um, as the years go on. And now we even have some daily imagery for pretty much the entire planet at very high spatial detail. So 
these other areas um, that maybe haven't used remote sensing to a great deal, I think for many questions, um, using that interdisciplinary approach of what information could come from this branch of the natural sciences to support other questions, I think there's a whole world out there that, that could be explored. And also it allows people, as Oliver mentioned, to see the world from a different perspective. So we're often, we see it on the ground, we, we read about it, but to actually see it sort of from above and to actually get that spatial perspective can sometimes lead to new insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. Thank you very much, Professor Kalaska and Mr. Lucanus. I fully support your drive for interdisciplinary research. In fact, we all do. Um, so thank you for elucidating that in more detail there. Um, we really enjoyed discussing your fish and forest project with you. Um, for our listeners, you'll find a link to the project in the podcast description should you want to find out more. Um, thanks also to Archisman for his questions and thank you to you, the listener, for downloading and for listening. Once again, my name is Philip Gooding and you've been listening to the Indian Ocean World podcast. The Indian Ocean World podcast would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. This podcast series is part of the SSHRC-funded partnership project Appraising Risk Past and Present, interrogating historical data to enhance understanding of environmental crises in the Indian Ocean world. 